Hi everyone, I'm Alfred Lambermont Weber, and uh, there may be some technical difficulty. Oh, here he is. Uh, here. Well, yes, are you there, Fred? Yeah, yeah. Good, so am I. Welcome. Welcome. Well, yes, we're, yes. We're, we're joined by Peter McKenzie, author of An Intimate Friend and, and Colleague and metaphysical younger brother of Bob Dylan and his new book, uh, On a Couch and 50 Cents a Day. Welcome, Peter. Peter and I, uh, we go way back. We haven't actually uh, seen each other since, I guess, the, the 1970s. Uh, Peter used to come over to our loft on Green Street in in the soho district in in new york city and it's such a pleasure to be here and i've been uh with your book here and uh i i'm i'm just gonna let people share share it those those who are watching you can uh get it now it's on it's on amazon bob dylan on a couch and 50 cents a day and this is uh this is the missing link in in Bob Dylan's life, and Peter's here to tell us all about it. Let me um, let me bring Peter in fully. And uh, how are you? Do you I'm I'm fine, Fred. It's nice to talk to you again after all this time. Thank you, thank you, great. Thank you, thank you. Likewise, Hi, do you have a do you, do you have a bit of light you? You can turn on there and maybe share it on your on you a bit more. If if not, your your light's fine. Uh, no, go go ahead. Do say you, hi to the well, first let me say hi to the audience. I'm pleased. Oh, to great! Be, I ha I haven't done podcasts before, so oh, uh, here here we are. Uh, and if you Fred, if you have any questions you want to ask me about it. Uh, you know, I can, I'll just free form. Uh, my wife is in the background on the camera there. Say hi, Catherine. Hi. <laughs> Catherine, <laughs> hi. Yeah. There she is. See this? I I've got my on. agent manager. She handles <clears throat> everything. She's terrific. Oh, uh, great. Okay. The, the book starts. I'm not on now, am I? No, you're not. The book, the book starts out uh, with a quote by Bob. Um, I don't have it right in front of me. Uh, uh, Brad, oh, well, well, I can tell it to you right, yeah, right, right read, now. Read the it says, quote to the book. Yeah, this says, quote, these are very good people. You can talk to these people, meaning Peter's family. Uh, they know me well. You can also talk to Peter. Uh, he's, he's old now. Peter goes to Harvard. Salutes to you. Uh, I actually went to the Harvard School of Public Health, so we're both Harvards. Uh, Peter's their son, it's Eve and Mac McKenzie, and they really took me in, and they were beautiful. This is Bob Dylan talking. Ah, they took me in, and I lived with them, and they fed me, and it was on 28th Street, and I stayed out all hours and came in and went to sleep on the couch. And Peter was there. I was his idol at the time. He was 15. Now he's 18, 19. He's in college. He's a very smart kid. Talk to them. So that is uh, Bob Dylan. Uh, uh, but this is this is really kind of the the uh, the uh, I'm just reading here for your book notes for three generations peter have been trying to figure people have been trying to figure out how bob zimmerman became bob dylan uh what occurred during his stay with the mckenzie's is the unknown missing piece the good news is peter mckenzie remembers everything and peter i want to ask you this okay i read your book how did you recall all of this detail it's extraordinary i mean you recall conversations you recall details you recall days 
gestures, looks on the face, etc. Over to you. Well, one of the things I fortunately have now, my father, this is very interesting because when I talk about this in the book, Bob has a photographic memory. Uh, my father had a photographic memory, but, and, and when they had conversations together, it was amazing that the literary quotes they would be able to bring up. And now I have, and yeah, uh, well, my wife wants me to show the book, the audio, the cover, here's the book. Here it is. Hold it back that's, that's my father and Bob on the cover. And okay, in any case, uh, let me get situated. I have very close to a photogenic memory, which means while it's not photographic in the sense that, in the sense that, um, uh, while I may not remember every word that I read on a page, I have a pretty good recollection uh, when somebody speaks. So I remember the essence of all the conversations, particularly the most important ones about that uh, 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 way back then. Now, the, the key is, remember, I was 15 when most of this happened. And when you're that age, when you have either traumatic or huge events happen to you that help shape your life, you remember those things. That's the most impressionable time. So, and because of how my parents and I loved Bob and he loved us, and, uh, and yeah, he taught me the guitar and harmonica. So, of course, I remember all those lessons. It, it's, it, that sort of thing was ingrained in me. You know, I would tell stories when I was in college to people. I've been telling these kind of stories to people for the last 50 years. So it's, 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 you know, it, it's almost cut in stone. I mean, when I wrote the book, uh, it was just a matter of organizing things. Uh, you know, and I, I also made notes when I was a kid about, about what happened. And also Bob would visit us after he no longer, he lived with us from uh, May through September of 61. And for the next two years, he would come back almost on a weekly or bi-weekly basis until he started to be getting super big. And after that, it became less frequent, as is easily understandable. So a huge chunk of time, basically the last two years in high school and my first year in college, uh, Bob was just there. So I just remember it. I have, I have that ability. Now, also, there are conversations in the book that take up about 30 or 40 pages, I guess. They're from the tapes that Bob made when he was living, uh, li living with us and after he left, uh, where he, on several occasions, when he came over to the house, when he came over to the house, uh, my parents would request that he do a song or he would volunteer to do a song and we recorded it. And what's great about those tapes, which have not been released, he sounds better on those tapes. Every take on every song that he sang at our apartment is better than any take he ever recorded live or on an album anywhere else. And what we're trying to do now is to make an arrangement to have those uh, tapes put together and released as a legitimate album so everybody can understand what, you know, Bob was all about then. Um, uh, I, I don't know what else to say, Fred, other than the, um, uh, I'm just trying to collect my thoughts. This was kind oh, of, sure, sure. You know, I was trying to, uh, is, is that, um, uh, and also, I'm a little anxious being the first podcast. I, you know, oh, I'm no, not, you're, I'm not you're a doing figure. fine. Oh, well, thank you. I'm not a public figure. And, and uh, yeah, times were different then. Um, but 
Yeah, there were no cell phones. The, you know what it is also? There were no distractions. It's not like you had way back then, you, you know, you, when you wanted to talk to somebody, you called them on the phone. There, there, and there were no answering machines. And uh, there were no electronic devices. There weren't 50,000 TV channels. So one could be more focused in an intimate basis, person to person, uh, than they are now with less distraction. That's one of the reasons I, I remember this. But I also, I wanted to write the book for a very specific reason. There have been literally thousands of books written about Bob Dylan by people that have never met him, only know him from either interviews they've seen, from the stage performances, but no real knowledge of the person. His songs speak for themselves. They don't need to be interpreted by anybody else. They don't, uh, you don't have to, you know, go to some lecture to have somebody analyze them for you. But most people really are interested in understanding the man himself. They want to know how was somebody able to produce such a masterful body of work for all these years? What was the driving force? What were the influences? What, what was his motivation? And there's been no book other than Chronicles, which Bob wrote himself, that even goes into a first person narrative from the source itself as to what happened and what he's, where he's at. Well, there's only one other person that's still alive on this earth besides Bob that experienced and went through everything with Bob as he was developing, who had a first row seat. That's me. My parents, of course, Kevin Crown, of course, but they're no longer with us. I'm still here. And so I figured, you know, no one has ever been able to get to the bottom of it or explain what exactly was going on in that first year, which is the key to everything. Without that, you can't understand what's going on, you know, why Bob did what he did. You don't understand the ingredients that went into the mix. You don't understand advice he was getting. You don't understand certain moves he made. Well, I watched it all. I watched my parents help mold him and, and avoid, you know, uh, certain pitfalls in when he should perform, who he should perform for. Uh, Bob idolized my father, absolutely idolized him. Like I idolized Bob, Bob idolized my father. And if you ask Bob now, pick three men. Obviously, he's going to mention his own father. Pick three men that you've met in your life that have been the biggest influence on you that you hold in the highest regard, my father would be one of those three and not necessarily the last of the three. Right. Could, and that's, could you, go ahead. Yeah. Could you tell us a bit about your father? Because oh, he's quite, a, quite all right. a person. Well, well, when Bob came over to the house the first time, which was in March, Kevin brought him up to the house in March, 1961. He thought he had died and gone to heaven, that he won the lottery. My father was the living embodiment of all those characters that John Steinbeck and Woody Guthrie would write about in their songs and in their books. And he was the embodiment of uh, when Pete Seeger, the Almanac Singers, uh, would sing. He was the embodiment in all those songs. My father was an orphan. He was born in 1904 in Virginia City, Nevada. Uh, he went to the um, University of Nevada, but he dropped out at 19 and went to San Francisco. He shipped out. He worked as a bank teller. He shipped out. And whatever was going on then, 
uh, he got involved in union politics. And as a result, he helped organize the one of the biggest unions uh, in the country, the National Maritime Union. Uh, and, you know, he was the chief negotiator on all of the uh, major contracts with all the seamen all, all over the world that were members of the union. He worked on the World Labor Board um, with Eleanor Roosevelt with the Lend-Lease program, you know, arranging all the, the sailors to be on the different ships and so on. And uh, Woody Guthrie, Cisco Houston, Pete Seeger, all of those fellows were members also of the National Maritime Union. And they looked up to my father. I mean, there was them, and then there was my father. My father always treated people equally. He was, as I said, uh, I would say he's the smartest man I ever met. Uh, Bob's very smart. Uh, I won't say Bob was second smartest, but he's right up there. But uh, when, when, when Bob uh, saw and met my dad for the first time, he understood what he was in the presence of. It was everything he was dreaming about uh, finding a place to land in. And when he came to 28th Street, that was it. Uh, and they used to have amazing discussions. And uh, my father gave him an education in history, uh, which he would have never gotten anywhere else. Gave him lessons in, uh, in politics, explained how the whole political system worked, going all the way back, starting with the, uh, the Romans, and, you know, gave him uh, uh, lectures or had discussions about religion with Bob. He, my father was, had an encyclopedic knowledge of history, law, everything else that you can possibly imagine. There wasn't a subject. My, my father was a voracious reader. There wasn't a subject my father was not familiar with. That was just his nature. And Bob never had never come across somebody like that before. And I don't think he's ever come across somebody like that since. So, bang, he hit the mother load. And that helped shape him. Now, my mother, who, of course, uh, loved Bob, she acted like a mom. He was a member of the family. That's what you got to understand. There were no expectations from him. When he started staying with us, it was made very clear. He was exactly like an older brother would be for me. He treated me exactly like an older brother, as a, me as a younger sibling. And my mother really treated him like a second son. And no, I was not jealous. I loved him too much. I was so thrilled he was there. He could do no wrong at the time. Uh, and he gave, she gave Bob because she was a dancer that had traveled all over the country with Martha Graham and rode on all the different buses. Uh, she was involved with the group theater. So she knew her, uh, she knew her, uh, her theater history, dance history, cinema history, showbiz, how tough it was and what went on behind the scenes. Boy, did she give Bob an education on show business. For example, she was talking one night about this skinny guy that she saw in 1948 at the Paramount Theater and uh, how he drove the people crazy, et cetera, and so forth. And so Bob said, well, who was he? He said, oh, Bobby, it was Frank Sinatra. He almost fell off his chair as I got wide. He said, you saw Frank Sinatra? And that was one thing. <clears throat> Another thing was he always, uh, Bob loved the movie On the Waterfront. I thought it was a great thing and was waxing poetic about the movie with uh, my father and my father said, Bobby, let me tell you something. I saw the movie too. It was a nice fantasy. Bob goes, what? What? What, Mac? 
but it was a nice fantasy. Would it have been the way things really were? Had it been a documentary, Martin Brando would have been dead within the first 10 minutes of the, of the movie. And he proceeded to explain in that conversation how unions worked, uh, how the, uh, you know, the order of power in unions and, and so forth. It, it brought to Bob a sense of reality about what was really there that he'd never been exposed to. And those type of things enable Bob to write so, so songs such as uh, the Ballad of Donald White with God on Our Side, Masters of War. I mean, these are, these are things that are, are a direct result of the influence of my parents and, and his blossoming uh, when he lived with us. And now me, my biggest contribution was that uh, I remember it all. So that's my contribution to history. My parents' contribution was they made history because they helped form Bob. Bob's contribution to history, we all know. Mine is, I'm just crying <laughs> what I remember. And yeah. of course, I helped sell a couple of albums because uh, in high school, everybody was asking me, Bob who? Who's this Bob? Why do you talk about Bob all the time? This is insane. And they, they, they would go, they would go crazy because they thought I was nuts. Well, a year later, when I mentioned the name Bob Dylan, instead of looking at me cross-eyed and going, you're crazy, Peter, what's wrong with you? They all said, when can we come over to the apartment and meet Bob? When can we come over? Anyway, it, 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 there's some funny stories there. Oh, oh sure. Now, 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 let me ask this. Getting yeah. to Bob him, himself, and, and people in the chat want to know, can you talk to us about Bob's character? Was he an honest, truthful, integral, God-fearing individual who would not sell out? Was he that type of person? That's a loaded question, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, well, no, no, no because I, there, I, I, no, no I, and, and I tell you, because there's a debate going on in the chat and you're a witness. So I'd like you to come forward. Oh, of course I'll tell you. Yeah. First of all, yeah, this, this short, what do you mean? No, the short hunters, no, we will not sell out. Okay. See, back then, he was an open book, at least with my parents. He got to understand when he was within the walls of 28th Street, he was just Bob. There was no mask. There was no kind of jockeying around. There were no real secrets hidden. I mean, yeah, and he, he wasn't particularly religious at that particular time. And uh, he also knew that if he started showing signs of being devious, deceitful, uh, hiding things, my parents probably would have kicked him out of the house, but they didn't, which is a testament to, I guess, no, he was not, he was a young man trying to find his way. He wasn't sure how to do it. Uh, yeah, they basically stopped him from going socialist or communist. That was an interesting story. He wanted to perform. Uh, he was offered $20 to perform for the, some socialist society. He was still very idealistic then. And my father said, what are you, out of your mind? You go do that, you're going to get pigeonholed. You're never going to get out of it. And my mother always made a point of saying, Bob, you must be free to do what you want. Because what you're doing now, it, it, you know, you, you, you can't allow yourself to be pigeonholed. That's one of the reasons... And I'll get back to your question. It didn't seem that he took political stands. Now, uh, my father uh, gave him a quote uh, from William Jennings Bryan, uh, who was it? William uh, it was William Jennings Bryan. I'm trying to remember who it was now. It slips my mind for the moment, but. Um, uh, the quote was basically, uh, 
that um, if you follow me, if I'm your leader and you follow me into the desert or you follow me, you know, somewhere because you take my word for it, it'll be just as easy for someone else to talk you out of where you went. So you better make your own decisions. I guess that's where don't follow leaders comes from. That's why Bob always hated being called voice of a generation. You know, he was basically saying, make up your own mind. So the answer to your question uh, is he was a straight arrow. At that point, that's not to say he wasn't mischievous, but when we uh, really interacted with him on a daily basis over the period of two or three years, he was an absolute straight arrow. Uh, you know, whatever happened afterwards, uh, that was not on our watch. And even though I... Right, right. Uh, so now, I... And my, my point, my point is, and this is what I want to address to all, to all your listeners, is that I'm not, I'm not in the, uh, the book is factual. It's not um, theoretical. It doesn't, um, I don't know what the right word is. It's um, not hypothetical. So unless I've seen it firsthand, from Bob, and I've experienced it, I will not comment on it because I wasn't there. So if other people have had experiences where, where, where Bob did something bad to them and they want to talk about it or they feel they've been shafted or whatever, they're, they're free to speak about it. I've never seen any of that. So I'm only going to speak from my specific uh, purview. So next question. Oh. Go ahead. Okay, uh, let, let me just give you some, some, some background. Okay. I remember meeting, uh, uh, being out in, in um, Hollywood, and uh, my first day back in Hollywood from Mexico, I meet uh, uh, a former girlfriend of, of Bob Dylan, who actually is a reverend. And that's the Reverend Sally Kirkland, a former a, a, an actress. She's a very uh, eminent actress. And we, we became friends, Sally and I. And at that time, Bob Dylan was a very fervent, uh, uh, a very fervent student of the life of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I'll explain that to you. After and you. and he was writing uh, songs like uh, Senor, Senor, which in Spanish means, oh Lord, oh Lord, can you tell us what we're waiting for, Lincoln County Road or Armageddon, right? Right. And that's, and, and, and people are still talking about that. I mean, you look at the world stage and, and, and people are going to say, are still saying, Senor, Senor, uh, can you tell us what we're waiting for? Is it Lincoln County Road or Armageddon? Right? Right. And, and uh, Sally Kirkland, uh, who, who had been intimate with Bob Dylan and who's a reverend herself and who knew at that time that Bob Dylan was a student of Jesus Christ and was. Uh, his his then current girlfriend was a Christian, uh, was heavily involved in Christianity. And so he's a person that it seems to me that is God oriented. And we have one of the, uh, and so there's this debate going on. I mean, a high minded debate in certain ways in the, or conversation in the chat uh, James is saying, I love the albums Dylan did as a saved Christian. Great writing and great performances. And then J James goes on in another place to say, I think I remember that he, Dylan, admitted selling his soul to the devil and his continuous work was him fulfilling his side of the bargain. Now, I don't remember that. Do you? 
I don't remember him. He I, Bob never said that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Bob. Bob said, Dylan. In, he would never in, say something like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the the uh, the people that I've known yourself, and then Sally Kirkland, who was Dylan's girlfriend and lover as an adult in Hollywood. She is an award-winning actress in Hollywood. And, and she and I were very close friends uh, uh, for a while. She testified to his deep and abiding orientation toward God. So this stuff that's going on in the chat, I think, is, is troll-like baloney that's being put out there. You're absolutely right. Uh, Oh, yeah. The the interview that uh, a lot of people have seen, you know, on 60 Minutes, where he does make an illusion that he made a a bargain with uh, the, the guy upstairs. He's mysterious about it. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't come out and say it. He's never said that. I want to explain something. By the way, before I go on, the person, the quote, that my father gave to Bob is from Eugene Debs. That's that's the guy, Eugene Debs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Four times about not following me into the desert or out of the desert. Um, my father's uh, taught Bob, because uh, a lot of people were horrified when Bob supposedly went Christian on them because he was, you know, a nice Jewish kid. And as of today, He's, you know, Jewish and all, all that. But when my father was giving him lessons in history from, uh, you know, from Buddha, from Jesus, Moses, all those people, uh, Muhammad, I mean, he explained all that to Bob. And his, he said to Bob, listen, if you want to really understand something, you have to immerse yourself in it. And after you do that, then you can comment on it. So Bob, being the naturally inquisitive person, if he wanted to really find out about what religions are all about, he's going to immerse himself in that. So he spent a few years, you know, uh, immersed in in uh, in Jesus and 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 Protestantism or Catholicism, whatever you wanted to call it. Uh, then he went back to his Jewish roots. He's explored everything. You can't not explore things and then purport to know about them and comment on them. And Bob, uh, with his inquisitive mind, wanted to know everything. That's the kind of person he was. He's very sensitive to all that. So uh, he, he has, uh, I'll tell you what Bob really believes. Because my father, he discussed it. My father has said, Bob, you can measure uh, how uh, religious a person really is by their humanity. You substitute humanity for religion. And that is, that's the credo that you can, um, you can live by. And I think that's what Bob really embraces, humanity, and whether it's an entity, God that he reveres, uh, I think it's humanity that is, it's uh, an inner sense of what's right and what's wrong, uh, I think is what he tries to uh, project and then without preaching to anybody, let them make up their own decisions uh, and how to interpret what he's saying. I mean, like everybody else, he's just trying to get through life the best he can, like uh, we all are. It's in that sense, Bob's not different than any one of us. I've always looked at Bob differently than other people anyway. And maybe th this relates back to your question. To me, Bob's special gift is that he has the ability to put words in a specific order that no one else can. That's it. Other than that, he's perfectly normal. Next. <laughs> right. That's all. Uh I, and uh, 
Yeah, so I, I, you know, people are just beating this to death. Uh, yeah, they, uh, yeah, they should, uh, stop. they should stop it. It's a, it's a waste of time. That's why I wrote the book. You read the book, you understand right. where Bob is coming from. You don't need to read anything else. I mean, you can, but people have read Chronicles. I'm sure all your listeners and people tuning in read Chronicles if they're interested in Bob, because Bob wrote it. This book covers everything that Bob left out of Chronicles. If you take those two together, you don't need to read any other books on Bob Dylan. Not really. Although, the Susie wrote all those books. Free Will and Time is great because Susie was a great person and, and she was also like an older sister to me. She's the um, uh, woman that's on the cover of the Free Wheeling Bob Dylan and was Bob's first big love from 61 to like 63 in New York, etc. at that time. And uh, she would come over to the house all the time too, with or without Bob. Um, yeah, and that's really what got him interested in communism and socialism. Uh, and because she was, you know, into that. But it's, look, people can do whatever they want. I'm only making a suggestion. Uh, it's like Bob saying, <clears throat> he always said to me, Pete, the success, a person is successful if they try to do the best they can in whatever they do. Therefore, you can't put a, if someone's best ability is to become a janitor and they can't get beyond that, but they're using all their abilities, then they're just as successful as someone that becomes a leader of a country. If as long as you take whatever gifts God gave you, big, small, or whatever, and try your best with what you know you have, that's success, whether it's acknowledged by the outside world or not. So, you know, Bob's not that complicated to figure out. He's really not. And that's why uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book, because uh, there have been so many misconceptions and because so many people, there have been thousands of books, millions of opinions, and none of them get it. They're just spitting their wheels. There's, they're, you know, they're speculating. Just look at the songs. Now, that's all I'm saying. I well, go ahead. I'm I'm I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm on a different. Uh, I was on a different plane right now. I'm back. I'm back to you. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Good. You know, I I would uh, wondered if if um, you could take the book that you were just showing to me. Yes. And and go to the introduction. Oh, you want? Oh, you want me to? Yeah. Read something? And and. Uh, there's a passage there. It's okay. a few paragraphs long. It's maybe a page long. And it starts out, my family always protected Bob's privacy. Okay. All right. I got and, it. And this long passage. And I wondered if you could read that. And I, I would like the people in the chat, especially those with sort of trollish ten tendencies. Okay. Uh, uh, to to uh, begin to listen carefully. Okay, okay? I, I, will, I will read most of the introduction. It, it only takes about two or three, about four minutes. It's, it's a couple pages. All right, we already heard the quote that Fred at the beginning talked about Bob talking about me and my parents. And it goes on, it says, the above quote, this is from the introduction. The above quote is from an interview Bob did in 1965. I wasn't made aware of it until 30 years later. He makes clear with those comments, if anyone had any questions or wanted to fill in the blanks, they should ask us, meaning the McKenzie family. Despite Bob's advice, we were never contacted by the interviewer. I can say now that that interviewer happened to be Robert Shelton that uh, wrote the book No Direction Home. It's too bad Mr. Shelton never contacted us because, you know, uh, I wish he had. 
because his book would have been completely different. He would have had a completely different take on Bob. In any case, um, okay. One afternoon, 60 years ago, my mother asked Bob what he really wanted. I want to be as big as Harry Belafonte, Eve, he told her. That was his desire then. We all know how that turned out. Okay, this is where it gets into what I think what you want. For the spring and entire summer of 1961, our New York City apartment at 10 West 28th Street was Bob Dylan's home. And I remember everything. Moving to New York City was a pivotal time for him. And every choice he made was crucial. The first important crossroad in his career. Even after he moved out, he would come back to visit on a regular basis. Now, this is where we start, Fred. I'll read the paragraph. My family always protected Bob's privacy, rarely speaking out and only then with his knowledge. He knows about the book. He had his own way of signaling. He knew the answers from us would be truthful, but just as importantly, discreet. His trust in my parents was limitless. We were intimate observers of his singular talent as he grew from earnest teenager to serious adult. While his stay at 28th Street has been documented, no one else knows how deep the relationship ran or what transpired there, the why it was so influential emotionally and professionally to his development. It is the key missing piece of Bob Dylan history. Ah, musical accompaniment. It's great. <laughs> By all accounts, his rise to fame would not have happened as rapidly or smoothly without the Mackenzies. That's the paragraph you're referring to, I think. Uh, yes, and keep keep on going. Okay. Bob was always lo looking out, for, always looked out for right. me. Right, Bob always looked out for me. If I liked the shirt he was wearing, be it, uh, he let me wear it. Um, the light's a little a little um, dark in here, so I'm having trouble reading this. But oh, on many occasions, when he finished his daytime business, he'd take out his guitar, and the guitar lessons would begin. He showed me uh, his music techniques as well as the special way he played harmonica. Brian McGee played this way, he would say. Jesse Fuller played this way. Now master them and you'll come up with your own style. No one ever got that kind of tutelage from him. If I had a problem with my contemporaries, he advised me how to handle it. He loved my artwork and always asked me how I got my ideas. We talked about history and literature. I met his fellow musicians when they dropped by the apartment or when he'd go outside or when we'd go outside uh, on outside adventures together. He loved to pray, pr prank Dave Van Rock. It was always, and I emphasize this, it was always the real Bob. No pretension of hiding behind a mask, unlike the many other personas he began trying on uh, public consumption as his fame grew. Uh, the first time we met him was January 16th, 1961. And it, it just goes on and on and on. It, I don't really need to read the uh, rest of it because, I mean, it's just background. And, um, but I'll give you a, a great story about his sense of humor. And, and, and it, it shows the relationship. 
we had a conversation in 1991 on the phone uh, when he called and I was speaking to him and he said to me at that time in 1991, and this is a quote of the conversation, 30 didn't bother me, 40 was no big deal, but when 50 happened, it was time to take stock of my life. He did look back after all. So for all those people that think Bob doesn't look back, he did, and he does. The conversation wasn't entirely, this is a good one, wasn't entirely serious. He decided to give me some advice on how to pick up women. He went, Pete, I'm going to give you some very valuable input. Listen closely and don't forget, I'm going to show you how to get anyone you want. It's foolproof. When you go to a party, dress a little off the beaten track, but spiffy. Stand against one of the walls as if you're not observing. I mean, as if you're just observing. And it will give off that mysterious aura. Before you know it, all the women will be coming over to you because they can't resist mystery. Then you make your move. Thank you, Bob, I replied. That's very nice of you to share that knowledge with me. There's only one problem with it. What's that, he asked, deadpan, already anticipating my answer. Well, you're Bob Dylan and I'm not. <laughs> and he fell off the chair laughing. That's just one, one of the little stories. So, uh, th see, these are things where you really get to understand when you read this book, what he was really like in person. Uh, and I don't know, ask another question, Fred. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, well, look, I, I, here, I, I here. can read the whole book right now to you. And, oh, oh, yeah, but, sure. And, and you know, I, I, would en I, I would encourage you to make it into an audio book, you know, that, that's what that, that's what we're thinking of doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's, here's a question that kind of jumped out at me. Okay, when I read it. Okay, right. because this issue uh, this issue came up recently. And my question is this, what is wrong with Rolling Stone magazine? Because you mentioned in the book that mm -hmm. they did not list Bob Dylan among the 100 greatest guitar players. And last week, they did not list, list the great Canadian icon, Celine Dion, who's incredible, among the 100 greatest singers. So I think that Rolling Stone magazine is a bit out to lunch when it comes to music. Over to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a reason we never read it. Um, I won't knock it. I will tell you this. This is an interesting connection. Uh, and I'll explain about Bob's guitar playing in a minute. Uh, Janie Schindelheim, who was married to Jan Wenner, who was the founder of Rolling Stone magazine. I, I know Jan Wenner because Paul Balser, who was my college roommate, is Jan Wenner's financial advisor. So, you know, it's a small world. Yes, it is. Well, we'll talk later. We'll, we'll talk another time about this. Uh, Okay, but, but go. I, I didn't but, mean. I didn't Jane, mean to cut you off. Oh, go, no big go, deal. Go, go ahead. Janie Schindelheim was a very good friend of mine in high school. We were classmates, and I saw her at our fiftieth reunion. It was very interesting. Well, Janie Schindelheim went out to San Francisco, out to California, where she met Jan Winter. Jan Winter married him. It was Janie's family that financed Rolling Stone magazine. So she was the co-founder along with Jan Winter after they got married of Rolling Stone magazine. So uh, uh, that's the connection, but I don't know how they make their, their decisions. Uh, I, I play the guitar myself and harmonica. Yeah, I mean, he's an absolute, you know, I've, I've played with everybody. I've, I've met with everybody. I've, I've seen millions of people. 
thanks to Bob once, and I'm not going to go into it, into the details, but in New York, I got introduced to the Beatles by Bob. That's a whole other story. I'll get into that another time. Uh, he, was, he wasn't playing a joke on me, but he did invite me up to the hotel where the Beatles were staying in 65, and I, I lost it. You talk about star power. To me, Bob's always been Bob. I've never understood what a big fuss about him was. But when I saw these four guys sitting on a couch, I couldn't wait to get out of there. I mean, you know, but uh, his guitar playing, uh, he is the best rhythm lead guitarist I've ever heard. And I've heard everybody. Why Rolling Stone did not put him in the top 10 is beyond me. Um, no, is it, they didn't put him in the top 100. Well, they should have. Well, yeah, they should have put him in the top 10. I'll tell you why. Tell your listeners, you go back. And, oh, I'm telling your listeners. OK, but if you ever speak to anybody apart from this podcast and they ever question you about his guitar playing, uh, you take, take a look at uh, on his first album, for example, of uh, I don't know why I love you like I do on his on his first song, sung by Jesse Fuller, or his song in his third album, Times They Are a Change in God on My Side. Uh, on his fourth album, The Chimes of Freedom. Nobody uh, uh, plays like that. You listen to the integration of his voice and the rhythm and the individual notes of the guitar and and, and how the two were meshed together. Nobody on a stage, other than maybe Pete Seeger, because Pete Seeger is such a great performer. There is nobody on a stage, as far as I'm concerned, that can hold an audience, just a man and his guitar, on a stage by themselves as uh, Bob Dylan. As much as I love Bruce Springsteen, Bruce Springsteen couldn't do it. John Lennon couldn't do it. Paul McCartney couldn't do it. And I'm talking about just one person on a stage two hours, no other instrumentation, just themselves. I've never ever seen anybody, no matter how good they are, whether as a singer or a guitar player or anybody, you know, in, at least in this generation, that can no. do it like Bob could. And, and that's why he's a great guitar player. Because guitar right. playing, I mean, unless you're going to be Segovia and the guitar is the main instrument, or you want to be, um, uh, you know, Eric Clapton is a guitar player, or uh, Jeff Beck, or whatever. Uh, oh, by, by, by the way, it, it was just announced on the news that Jeff Beck, Beck passed away today. No. Yeah. Oh, oh, Christ. You got it. It was kidding. just announced. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to say some words about that? Yeah, I, I, I would. I actually, believe it or not, I, I had the honor of meeting him once uh, backstage at one of his performances. Uh, I was introduced to him by somebody that knew him and knew me. He was a uh, very polite, uh, very, um, it's almost like the handshake that Bob gives. When Bob gives a handshake, it almost feels like a dead fish. It's not because he doesn't like you or doesn't care about you. He's protecting his hand. <laughs> And Jeff Beck was just like that. But he was very nice, very sweet. And, and to me, I think he's one of the absolute greatest guitar players there was in the world. Well, what did he what did he die from, did it say? Uh, you know, I didn't, uh, I I just read the uh, the uh, headline. I didn't. My, my wife just looked. Uh, bacterial, meningitis. bacterial meningitis. Oh, God. It's a, it's a brain inflammation. Yeah. Oh, that's awful. That is awful. Yeah. I, I, I won't make any more jokes to the rest of this conversation. That That's... He, 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 78. 78. That's still too young. Yeah. Uh, that's just awful. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, look, let, yeah. So so we send Jeff Beck a salute? Yes, we should. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, a, and, a real, and a real shout out. Now... I, I've you, you can't see it or maybe you can, but I, I, I've got your book. We're, we're on split screen and I've got the oh, Amazon yeah. book description up there. And I want to go there and I want to read read from this. So 
uh, with your indulgence, Absolutely. I want to read, Go read this. Go ahead. It says, uh, Peter McKenzie's memoir is an intimate record, observations, interactions, conversations, descriptions of early writing attempts never seen before, images of handwritten song drafts, accounts of guitar and harmonica lessons, and it doesn't end in 1961. Dylan visited the McKenzie's many times over the decades for their advice and encourages. He was for all practical purposes, a member of the family, an adopted son and old, older protective brother. brother. Uh, uh, Bob Dylan on a couch and 50 cents a day is Peter McKenzie's retelling of the year when Dylan, hungry for knowledge and experience, was fed at every level by the McKenzie family. It's an all access pass to an eyewitness account of a magical time and a must read for anyone interested in Bob Dylan and the 50 cents, uh, just so for people know, that refers to the fact that your, that your uh, uh, parents would put 50 cents on, Bob, on, on, the, on the table every day so that Bob would have bus fare and something to eat. Because I, I think the subway fare back then was about 15 cents. Is that correct? That's right. Every day. Yep. Yeah. Now, here is the question that I have for you, and it's a serious question. And uh, uh, at the time that I first met Sally Kirkland was the time that I was in Hollywood as a movie producer. OK, so I've got some, you know, interest in this area. Hey, man. This is this book would make a great film. I've got to tell you that. Okay, it would make okay. a beautiful, thank you, biographical film. And I think that what you have to find is a, you know, get out there and find someone who a producer, and he'll find a screenwriter, and you guys will find some money. Maybe even Bobby will finance it, and and so. I'm just uh, putting the the wind and sails uh, behind you, and and I hope that that you uh, look into this possibility because I think that this is a this is an area that'll make a great movie. Whether it's a made for TV movie, whether it's in the theaters, whether it goes to Sundance whether it's an indie, whether it's a major studio, I don't know. But uh, I think, uh, you know, you might even talk to Bobby's people that this book should be made into a movie. Okay, over to you. I well, want to hear your plans, your reactions, what you think of uh, that idea. And are you ready to take some practical steps to make this happen? Because things can happen by just picking up a phone, as you well know. Well, thank you for the, first of all, for the vote of confidence. That, that is really appreciated. Uh, I'll be humble about this, but I agree with you. Um, I do think it would make a great movie. I've thought about it. Uh, I'm not sure exactly who to contact because I don't really have that many contacts at this point in, in the film world. Uh, I think I know how to go about it, but it may be just turned out to be a matter of luck that I, you know, but luck, of course, you make your own luck by knocking on doors. I'm ready to go out all out to do it. I, I agree with you. Uh, I know they're making a movie uh, about I believe it's supposed to star uh, Timothy Chalamet as Bob Dylan of when Bob went electric. And I think that's great. And I hope it's a r raving success. But again, the, the screenplay, the, uh, uh, and the time period, 
and the book which it's based on was written by somebody who wasn't there uh, so I absolutely agree with you that th this um, there was a film called I'm not there I'm not going to give my opinion on it I don't think it really captured Bob's essence but I agree with you if they made this into a film or if it could be made into a film it it would be the definite uh, Bob Dylan biography. I mean, you don't, you, you could weave other things into it from other areas that maybe I don't cover. Maybe they take a little artistic license. I, you know, once it's sold or whatever, the basic author, me, would be out of the picture. Although I would demand, oh, that's another thing. Uh, I'll get to that after I finish this. Uh, I agree with you. I, I, uh, plus, we have the we have several hours of tapes that Bob made at our apartment of singing either songs that he wrote or songs by others from 61 through 63. If you put that out as a record or as like the soundtrack to the album, you will get a gut feeling of uh, exactly what was happening with Bob uh, musically from 61 through 63, which is his most formative period, you know, before all the big stuff started coming out. Uh, and we have that. And he sing, his voice on those is great. Bob Dylan, by the way, has a great singing voice. The voice that you hear on the records, it's not real. That's not his real, natural voice. It's an, it's an affectation. If you could hear the original tapes that Bob made sitting in the living room, relaxed and comfortable, the man can sing. It's a rich voice. It doesn't have that nasal stuff to it. It does not have that. Uh, but he's a great showman. I mean, he knew what he wanted to do. And my parents never questioned uh, about it. They never gave me advice about that because they understood what he was trying to accomplish and he did it. Uh, I agree. You take, you incorporate those tapes in conjunction with, and those tapes, by the way, are described in detail throughout the book. You put those tapes together with what's in the book. Yeah, you'd, you'd have a great movie. You really would. Um, uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure how to do it. Maybe I'll talk to you later, Fred. Asks for some advice because you've been in that world out there. But I agree with you. And I, I, I thank you for your vote of confidence and your enthusiasm and, and the fact that you would think it would make a great movie. You've been involved in that world. You know, you've, you know a, lot, a lot of different people. Yes, yeah, send all the producers. Give them my phone number, Fred. Give any producer. Well, well I... I've been out of that world. Uh, but mind you, that this was way back when that I was there. It was when I came back from Mexico in the early 1980s. So we're talking 30 years ago. That's not that I was there. What is, and what is time? What is that's a blink <laughs> of time? You know. Uh, no, but I mean, the, this is uh, this is you. You you have a very you, you, you have a very, very valuable script and information here and historical that can really be made into a gripping movie that a lot of people would be very interested in, in seeing. And um, well, we're, we're now have come to the, um, to the top of the hour. So uh, I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Okay. One is, do you have any other books uh, planned or? Uh... Act, uh, not, not at the moment. I'm, uh, what I am doing is I'm, I'm jotting down. Uh, there were several things just in terms of the storyline in order to keep it as consistent as possible without sidetracking, since it's really about supposed to be about Bob, I've got a lot of other stories I could put in like a second edition of the book, but I, I, I edited certain things out because I needed to give the essence, you know, right. I mean, 
and the essence is a lot to digest. You know, why why throw in asides? Uh, right. Necessary. What I was thinking of doing, uh, and I I'm not sure um, with the manuscripts. I don't know how those are legally covered. I would love to be able to put out a a book of all the original Bob manuscripts that have passed through my hands, most of which are now in the Morgan Library in New York. Uh, because, for example, uh, the public has never seen uh, an original draft, uh, let's say, of like a Rolling Stone. I mean, there was one that was sold at Sotheby's a few years ago. That's a whole different kettle of fish. This is the original draft. They've never seen an original draft of Desolation Row. They've never seen an original draft of God on My Side. They've never seen, uh, well, they've seen, maybe they've seen a draft of Blowing in the Wind. Uh, they've never seen a handwritten draft of Don't Think Twice It's All Right. Um, They've never seen a handwritten draft of Masters of War or Hard Rain. Those have passed through my hands. Bob showed them all to me, or he showed them to Kevin Crown, and a lot of those manuscripts were passed on to me and to the family when uh, Kevin Crown died. I inherited them, and my parents, my mother fortunately, saved all of Bob's handwritten manuscripts when he was living with us, talking New York, Talking Bear Mountain, Old Man. Uh, she saved those, and Bob knows about it. And occasionally he would drop off a manuscript to see what my parents would think about it and leave it there at the house. So those were all basically museums and stuff and whatnot. I still have some things, uh, but I would love to be able to share that with the world. But, you know, maybe I'll consult with you, Fred because you're a lawyer and you understand certain legalities. I can't just go doing it. I think I have the right to do it, just as I think I have the right to release the tapes. But not being a lawyer, I want to make sure that everything is done above board. Because the one thing, remember, Bob had absolute trust in the McKenzie family. I don't want to go behind Bob's back or do right. anything without him knowing about it. Right. I'm, not, I'm not that concerned about a lot of all the other uh, stuff. I don't care whether his manager, his agent, what, they don't matter to me. The only thing that matters to me is Bob. That's the relationship. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What I'm trying to do now, because I, I have not been in touch with him for a long time. I don't have his phone number anymore. And I'm trying to figure out a way that he and I can speak directly because from what I understand, uh, and I like his organization, villain organization, very much. But Bob does not involve himself with the day-to-day -day operations. He's doing his thing. And their job is to keep as many people away from Bob as possible, no matter what the relationship. That's right. what they do. Uh, so um, if I can figure out a way, uh, which shouldn't be too hard, I, you know, and, it's also a matter of the right timing, being ready for it. I, uh, other than speaking with Bob a couple of times uh, in 75, 91, 94, you know, in the last few years, uh, since I've gotten married, for example, Bob always wanted to know what the girl was going to, what the woman was going to be like, the woman that I married. Well, He's never met my Catherine. Right. She's going to blow him away. That's that. That's a great excuse to call him. Say, Bob, that's you, right. me, you know, I want to introduce my wife to you. My wife gets him when if I lock my wife in the same room with Bob for an hour with her brains and her intelligence, she's a doctor, but also with her knowledge. She's also used to be a former fashion model. She's great. She's a great photographer. She's a terrific singer. She can do anything. I mean, I, I mean, she intimidates me, but that's okay. That's the way it should be. You know, I'm the king of the house. She's the boss. That's the way it is. But you know, it's simple. <laughs> that's a good. I, 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 I've never heard that said before. Well, I'll have to tell it to my wife. It's good. very well said. Good.
and I'm a very lucky fellow. Well, if she went into a room with Bob, because Bob's never met anybody like her before, just like he's never met anybody like my folks, he would come out of it talking to himself. So I would love to, uh, I mean, she just gets it. She gets it. She always gets way before I do. It's, it, it's terrific. But you know what? I've got a great memory. So my job in life, I guess, is to chronicle things. Fine by me. You know, we all have our place. But um, uh, that would be that'd be a good idea. You know, I have to figure out a way to get the, you know, he's back home. He's not touring. He's not going to be touring again for another couple of months. So if it could be arranged for me to have a direct conversation with him for 10 minutes, it would all be over. It would all be resolved. Bang, bang, bang. One, two, three. Yes, no, maybe. I don't know. Uh, because I would never want to do He knows about the book. I got one thing I did do is I made sure to let his organization know before I published the book that I was doing the book. If they had any problems with it, they better let me know now. And they said, nope, we trust what you're going to do. Go to it. I didn't have to ask them for permission. But again, I will never do anything major behind Bob's back. So obviously, this would be a question. Get it to Bob. Let's see how he feels about it. Uh, and if he gives a thumbs up, let's go for it. Yeah, yeah, I so think so. That's the now, way. Now, now, I, yeah, yeah. Hey, the final question is, is this. Uh, do you have a way that people can get in touch with you, either a website or some other way? Uh, I, I have an, e there's an email address on my book. Uh, okay. Let me, let me give it to you right now that's how people can contact me and i i check it i will it's um let me go find it it's right here it's um let me get it okay here is the uh gmail address that you can email me okay it's printed on the copyright page in the book oh nice it's m k b D D is oh, in David. M is in Marty. K is in as in uh, as in as in Kevin. Yeah. Uh, B is in boy. Uh -huh. P is in Peter. N as in Nancy. Y as in York. So it's okay. M K B P N Y. Oh C C is in. Okay, this is the whole address then. It's M. K B P R No, let me start again. This is this is what I can't I can't I'm I'm it's small. My wife could read it, but I'll do it again. Okay, it's M K B Y N Y. All right, Catherine, you read it. My wife is gonna read it. Okay, great. I'm, Thank I'm, you. Thank you. You know, I'm in my seventies now. I'm not as, yeah. as I'm wearing my glasses. I never used to wear glasses. You never used to wear glasses, Fred. Now you're wearing glasses. Oh, right? yeah. We're NKBP. Yeah, could, could you say it again? It's, 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 it's not quite getting through. Okay. MKBP. NYC. Okay. At gmail.com. Got it. M, okay, M is in Mary, K is in Catherine, B is in boy, P is in Peter, NYC, New York City, at gmail.com. Right. right. Perfect. So that's how people can get in touch with you, those who are listening. And let me tell you, I look forward to seeing this either in the theaters, oh. uh, a, a, a made for TV movie, something. I think. It's an historical document, and it could happen. So, uh, uh, Peter, I want to thank you very much. Our friendship, I know, goes back decades. I still remember yes, it does. When, when when you would come over to our loft there on oh, yeah. Green Street, and we would have some good times. So, uh, oh, by the way, yes. by the way, because you mentioned good luck. 2023 is in the Chinese astrology. It's the year of the water rabbit. And the two things to remember in the water rabbit 
are it's a year of patience and good luck. So I think that you're on the right track. <laughs> well, that's great. Uh, you're going to love my, my wife, by the way. Does, I just want to let you know, because uh, I hadn't let you know before. She's been a follower of your site for a long time. I'm, oh, really? Oh, I'm, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm so glad about that. Yeah. I, well, they, yeah, we'll be sending you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So so we'll be sending you the links to this interview and it'll be up on our website. Oh, that's and great. She'll enjoy seeing this interview on our, our website, I'm sure. Oh, that's great. So let me hold this up for a sec. This is the cover of the book. Oh, yeah. As they see it on the screen, which my wife designed, by the way. Oh, wow. That's it's Bob, beautiful. my father. And then on the back is... There's the back. Oh, that's, yeah. That's a photograph that was taken uh, by Howard Harrison, who was our downstairs neighbor. Oh, boy. And who Bob, they were friends. He would always drop downstairs um, to say hi. Yeah. So these are all historical photos. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah. And there's stuff in the book also. There are pictures of parts of manuscripts i legally at this point i couldn't put whole manuscripts in but there yeah. are there are there are uh examples of manuscripts that nobody's ever seen before in there throughout the book and there are basic there are stories in there that no one again has ever heard uh and and uh anyway i'm glad you put this up on the split screen on on your site i think it's great Anybody that's looking can just go to it, click on it, read what we were talking about today, read what you read, and, and also read the reviews. One thing I'm really pleased about uh, is that of all the Dylan books that are up on Amazon so far, uh, mine is tied with one other book for the highest rating, 4.7 oh. out of 5. Oh on, my God, Bob! Which is terrific. It's gotten great. That reviews. is wonderful. But also, that is absolutely wonderful. Th this is another thing, and this is why there's been some difficulty reaching out to people. And this is important because it's 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 about integrity. The story had to be told a certain way. The narrative in this book. Initially, it was sent to some publishers, and yes. There was interest in the book by a couple of major publishers. Why was this book not done through them? Very simple. They would have changed. I would have lost control of the narrative. Right. Once they give you the, you know about this, once they give you the money and then they get the editor, they would have changed things or asked me to do certain things that's why I said, listen, whether we make money with it or not, it'd be great to make a million bucks on it. But if it doesn't, the point is, it was done for history. That's why we self-published it. Nobody, I edited it. I had two friends of mine, Jesse Kornbluth, who was a classmate from Harvard, and, ha and Har who's a well-known writer, and Harris Friedberg, who was head of the English department at Wesleyan in Connecticut, they were both friends of mine uh, from school. And of course, they are real, real literature buffs. I mean, that's what they do. Um, uh, and they went over the manuscript with me to make, you know, to, to help organize it a little bit. But it's basically 99% me. And they said, you do your thing. We'll just give you some advice, maybe how to arrange the chapters and so forth. If you want to do it, if you don't, don't. But what's in that book is me. It's not an editor, you know, it's not somebody else's opinion. It's not some publisher that puts something in because they wanted to make it commercial. It's, there's very, very little. I'm sure there's some, as there always is, but there's hardly any artistic license in this book. So what you read is what you get. That is Bob Dylan on those pages, period. Excellent. Very right. good. On that note. Well, li listen, thank you for doing this. Well, thank you thank for you having for me. Preserving this, I'm I'm really 
count myself fortunate that we met and that all these years later, here we are. Brett, and Godspeed. Well, Godspeed to you too. I'll speak with you soon uh, uh, privately. No, no question about that. Okay. Be well, be safe. And again, let's give one last shout out to Jeff Beck. That is yeah. a, that's a big loss in, in the music world. Right. All right? I'm right. going to go Good now. Enough. Talk to you soon. Okay. Thank, Thank you so you much. much. You okay. bet. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye to Catherine bye -bye. there. Okay. Bye-bye.